I'm free from the, the guilt, guilt that I carry, from that dull, empty life I'm set free, for when I, I met Jesus, he made
praise the Lord free and land. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're free this morning? I said, aren't you glad you're free this morning? You once were bound by sin. Some of you on the weekends, your whole life was ruled by drugs and alcohol and every kind of immorality that one could think. But now you can stand and say, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, what a privilege it is to get up every morning and know your sins have been washed away, that you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus Christ is your Lord. Hallelujah. Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, reading just one verse. Verse number 30, the word of the Lord said, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. One of the most important scriptures in the entirety of the Word of God. And I want to minister just for a few minutes. I've titled it, Elijah Repaired the Altar of the Lord that Was Broken Down. Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Would you bow your heads? Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the presence of the Lord that is in this house. We depend this morning upon the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We can do nothing without the Spirit of the Lord. Anoint me to minister. Anoint at the same time your people to hear, to receive, not only here in the sanctuary, but those that are watching by television, listening by radio, watching by the internet. Lord, make Take this text and open it up to their hearts and their minds, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said amen and amen. In just a few months, we will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of Sun Life Broadcasting Network. And every time you turn on the television and you turn on to SBN, you are literally watching a miracle. Because there is no earthly reason. There is nothing in the mind of man that could have created Sun Life Broadcasting Network to take it 10 years, not quite 10 years ago, from nothing until now reaching over 140 countries of the world. That's a miracle. Especially when you consider that we do not sell airtime. All the other Christian networks sell time to other preachers, and there's nothing wrong with that. Please do not misinterpret. There's nothing wrong with that. The good part on their side is it helps take care of most of their budget. But we don't do that. And the reason is very simple. We want the message to be consistent. From the time you turn it on in the morning until the time you turn it off in the evening. We don't want one preacher getting up saying it's this way and another preacher getting up saying it's this way, another preacher saying they're both wrong, it's this way, and another one saying, well, this one's a little right and that one's a little right. No, no, no. We want one message, one message, one message to go out. Jesus Christ and him crucified, resurrected, and seated by the right hand of the Father. It's all about Jesus. And I want to make a statement here. And I get 
negative emails every time I say this, but I don't care. God has raised up this network for a, such a time as this to reach the world. Now, do you understand that? I, I, I've, given, I, I've broken down at the beginning of this message the five major reasons why God has raised up Sun Life Broadcasting Network. And the first one is world evangelism. Now, listen, I'm going to take it even further than that. I believe that in certain countries of the world, God is touching and moving upon hearts of men, raising them up, giving them a voice in that country. But I believe God has raised up my father. God has raised up me. God has raised up Gabriel. God has raised up these men sitting on the platform. God has raised up Sun Life Broadcasting Network to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the four corners of the world. There's nearly 7 billion people on planet Earth, but the vast majority are sitting in darkness. They're blind. They're in slavery to sin. They're in slavery to religion. They're in slavery to false government, socialism, and communism. But God, but God raised up a man in Faraday, Louisiana, and has given him an anointing to take this gospel to the whole wide world. Hallelujah. You can't name me one other person that God has given a platform like this to reach the world. They're in darkness. Souls are dying. Men are crying. It's like the Macedonian call. You could hear them, come over and help us. Come over and help us. Come over and help us. We have heard that call. And I'm glad to say this morning, help is on the way. Help is on the way. Help is on the way. God has blessed this country as no other country for the express purpose to be the place from which the gospel can go forth. Now, do you understand that? Every nation has to play a part, but God has singularly called and blessed this nation for the purpose of shining that light into the darkness. Now, do you understand that? The, what I'm really saying is this. The vast majority of the responsibility to reach the world, God has laid it at the feet of the church in America. That's why we ask for your help and not ashamed to ask. That's why we ask, and we're going to keep on asking, because it's a big world. But we serve a big God who has a big plan for the redemption of the lost. Hallelujah. There's nothing that can stand against the power of the gospel. I didn't come here this morning to talk about this until Dad brought it up, but Nicaragua, and I said something about it, didn't plan on saying it, being destroyed from the inside. Churches being raided, arrests, demonstrations. They'll just, it's, it's, it's a powder keg about ready to explode. We went on television there in the 80s. The television began airing there right in the midst of their civil war. The country was literally fighting among themselves. The communists trying to overthrow a dictatorship. Both sides were bad. That's the problem. Both sides are bad, and all sides that don't know Jesus are bad. And we began airing the telecast there, and then they invited us to come for a crusade. I'm going to show you what the power of the gospel can do. 
the pastors sent word, would you come? And, and we, we, the communist forces had defeated the ruling hunter, the president, overthrown it, and it was now a complete socialist, Marxist country. We had to get permission from the then president of the country who had taken it by power and by force. We kept calling the embassy, writing, can we come, can we come, can we come to Managua, that's the capital. They kept blowing us off. We had scheduled a crusade in the country of Panama. Panama City, Panama. And we had done this, well, we were going to Panama anyway, but what was unique about being in Panama City was, it was it's a very western country, and, and they had a trucking company that we could rent enough trucks. And when we traveled and did crusades in those days, we filled up two 747 cargo planes with equipment, all the crusade equipment, all the television, everything that was needed. But we couldn't fly into Nicaragua, but we could truck the equipment in. And there was this one company, they had enough trucks. We get to Panama City. Our plan was to leave Panama on Monday and go in after the crusade to go into Managua, but we still had not yet heard anything from the government. They wouldn't respond, and we kept calling. Jim Woolsey kept calling. We kept this embassy, this ambassador, this person, this trying to every way that we can. And finally, Rick Motter came to dad and said, Brother Swaggart, by Saturday 12 noon, if I don't tell the trucking company, Rick was over all of our equipment that went on the road. He went home to be with the Lord a, a few years ago. He was a faithful servant when he worked here. He was a, a bear of a man, bear, huge, but a gentle, gentle soul on the inside. And he said, Brother Swaggart, if I don't let the trucking people know tomorrow at 12 noon they're going to lease the trucks to someone else. I've got to tell them, what have you heard? Nothing. And finally, at lunchtime, a few minutes before 12, Dad told Rick, tell the company we'll take the trucks. Oh, you've heard from Nicaragua. Haven't heard a word. Tell the company we'll take the trucks. But we haven't heard. Saturday night, haven't heard. Sunday morning, we haven't heard. Late Sunday afternoon, they finally gave the word. You could come. Oh, hallelujah. We loaded all those trucks up, and Rick, they took off for Managua, and the country was in a mess. I mean, gas was being rationed. The streets had, were, were a mess. There was guns everywhere, armed militia riding around in trucks, and it, it, it was not on the natural a safe place to be. And I remember we flew in on Tuesday, and the first thing I remember as we were driving in from the Managua airport was the lines of cars in front of gas stations, stretching a mile, a mile and a half because gasoline was being rationed. And we didn't know it until the meeting was over. We were staying in a little hotel there, and we didn't know, but uh, before we got there, electricity was rationed. And you would only have so much electricity per day, and that was it. But because the gringos, because the American preacher was here, we were going to make sure that they had electricity. 
And we had planned and asked to have the crusade in the baseball stadium. They are baseball mad in Nicaragua. And that baseball stadium, it was right outside of town, and it was built at a play that it was at a junction for all of travel. Buses came right there. There were bus stops uh, that came right by there, trains, everything. That It was the easiest place to get to. But they said, no, you can't have it there. You're going to have to have it in Revolutionary Square. This was the center of town. No parking, no seating, an open square. On one side was a blown up, burned out government building with communist propaganda spray painted on the walls. I still remember AK-47 spray painted on the wall. I still remember uh, death to the Yankees and not talking about baseball. And then behind it was a burned out Catholic church that had been destroyed in the fighting. And the reason why, they, and we come to find out there had only been two people that had ever been allowed to speak from this particular place, the Pope and Fidel Castro. But now, a Holy Ghost-filled preacher And, but there was a ruse to the whole thing. They were trying to hinder because in their minds thinking there's no parking, it'll be too hard from the people from the out, outlying parts of town to get there. There's no buses. There's no public transportation. So it'll be a failure. Starting at about on Friday, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Every time I would stick my head out the door, I could see columns of trucks. And those trucks were filled with people coming for the services. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I remember that first Friday night when I walked out, there were literally thousands upon thousands of people as far as the eye could see. We had gotten a hold of a couple of thousand chairs and set them down front, but that was all. But as far as you could see in one direction was a mass of people. They were hanging out of trees. They were sitting in trees. They were hanging on every word that was said. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, there's only one message that can break the back of a false government and a false religion. And it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. They were coming by. That's it right there. That's it. That's the burned out Catholic church right there. That's the people coming. They just kept coming. They kept coming by the thousands, by the thousands, by the thousands. They kept coming. Look at that. Look at that. That's that night. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You couldn't see the end of the crowd. How great is our God? How great is our God? How great is our God? Look at them in the trees. And when we left and we, oh, don't wait. <laughs> Who's ever sitting over in television? Clean out your desk right now. I dare you to put that up there again. I dare you. That's pathetic. But some of, but some of you got some pictures of you you don't want nobody seeing either. <laughs> and I mean, they came and they gave, but after that crusade was over, there was an explosion of churches, an explosion of churches that are still 
in operation today. Hallelujah. And that's why we've put more Bibles into Nicaragua than any other land. Let me tell you, the gospel can do. This is what God has called us for, world evangelism. Number two, he's raised up SBN to bring back to the church fidelity to the Word of God. Correct doctrine. Correct doctrine is the antidote to false doctrine. And there's so much false doctrine out there. And matter of fact, people don't like too many preachers. We don't want doctrine. The Bible is a book of doctrine. No one can get saved until the doctrine of salvation is presented. No one can get healed until the doctrine of healing is presented. No one can get filled with the Spirit until the doctrine of the infilling of the Holy, with the Holy Spirit is presented. We need doctrine. We need doctrine. It's not what Springfield says. It's not what Cleveland says. And nothing wrong. They're doing, they're doing the best. But it's what thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah. We must come back to the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, don't do it. If it ain't in the Bible, bad grammar, don't preach it. When they tell you, now what I'm about to give to you, such a great revelation, you won't find it in the Bible. You need to get out. Because this is revelation, the only revelation. Number three, God has raised up this network to bring back to the church the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit. Very simply this. To the evangelical world that doesn't embrace the Pentecostal way, the message is, come to the river. Come to the river. Come to the river and drink. But to the charismatics and the Pentecostals, the message is, come back to the river. Come back to the river. Come back to the river. The wind is still blowing. The fire is still falling. Uh, that river of life is still flowing. But the most important, and then another Bible prophecy, better understanding of Bible prophecy, but the most important reason why Sun Life Broadcasting Network has been raised up and is the miracle that it is, is to help repair the altar of the Lord that's been broken down. Listen to me, church. Listen to me, television. There is no other message but the cross. There is no other answer but the cross. For the sinner, the answer is the cross. To the saint, the answer is to the cross. To the sinner, come to the cross and receive justification. To the saint, stay at the cross. That's where you'll find your sanctification. It's not in your works. It's not in your ability. It's not in your ingenuity. It's not in your programs and plans, but it's in what Jesus did at Calvary. 2,000 years ago. Well, that's an old message. It's the only message that works. Like the, like the young preacher. You don't know nothing until you get to be at least 40. This Young preacher wrote Daddy a letter a while back. You need to get off TV. You, you, you're just, you just need to get off. You're a relic. You're old. You haven't changed your message. That's what he said. You have, no, 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 let me help you. Dad is the longest-running television preacher in the history of television. There's nobody that's been on television preaching longer than him. 
And he said, you need to get off. You're an old relic. Your message has never changed. And dad, dad generally never responds, but he responded to that one. Dear sir, in response to your letter, why would I ever want to change my message? It works. It works. The cross works. The cross works. The cross works. The cross works. As Dad said it on this platform 20 years ago, there's a new car in the cross. There's a house in the cross. There's healing in the cross. There's prosperity in the cross. Whatever you need, it's found in Christ and Him crucified. Hallelujah! So why are you out chasing the fads and the programs? Every once in a while when I'm traveling, and, you know, I find myself in a town and, made, and you know, and, and I have the opportunity just to slip into some churches. You know, I'll be somewhere preaching and I'll have a night service. And, I'm, and I'll... There'll be a big church. I'll go and I'll just slip in. I've done this several times. Just wait till service starts and slip in. Just watch. And it's embarrassing. It's just flat out embarrassing. Half the church is in shorts. They got donuts in one hand, coffee in another, making a mess. The preacher is up there with a T-shirt that should come down to here, but it stops here because his belly's too fat. And God help us. When you're too ignorant to realize you're so overweight, you're not supposed to wear skinny jeans. Now, I'm not saying you got to wear a suit and tie. No, no. If you walk out there and say, I said that, you, you, you're wrong. No, I'm not saying that at all. You wear whatever the best you have to wear. But it's when you purposely. It's when you purposely say, I don't have any respect. Now, this is not the house of God. This is a building. We're the house of God. But this is a building that's been dedicated for one purpose, the worship of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God has called us to help rebuild the altar. It was the darkest day in Israel's history. The Bible tells us that not one single righteous king ever sat on the throne of the northern kingdom of Israel. The Bible said of Ahab, who was the king at the time of this story, that he was the most evil. What an honor. You're compared to the other evil guys, and they say you're the most evil. That means you're pretty bad. The Bible said that he did more to provoke God, the anger of the Lord, than any other king. And the Lord gave a reason because of that woman, Jezebel. Jezebel was a wicked, wicked, evil woman who, though Ahab was already evil, had already brought in idols, she brought in more and more. And I won't go into all the time, all of the things they were doing. It's just gross beyond imagination, but the Bible said that Jezebel, that she literally seduced the men of the nation to follow after her evil ways. That's the reason why false doctrine is likened to the Jezebel spirit, because false doctrine is pleasing to the ear, pleasant to the eyes, and it titillates the flesh, and it's seductive. That's the reason why you've got to know the Word of God because false doctrine is so seductive that it can sweep you up into it and you don't even know it because you are deceived. And see, I heard Dad give the greatest analogy one time. He said, when a person is so deceived in false doctrine, 
It's the same as someone that has been born blind. They've never seen anything. And he said, you can hold up a spoon in front of that blind person all day long and describe it. But there's nothing in their brain that can relate to because it's never seen one. And he said, people can get so deceived by false doctrine that you can hold the truth right in front of them, and they can't see it. And the country worshiping, let me tell you, America's worshiping idols today. Idol worship is not over. And I'm not even talking about the world. There's idols in the church. The biggest idol in the church is preachers. You got people that worship preachers and not Jesus. Now, I want you to love me. I want you to respect me, but you don't worship me. I'm not God. There's only one that we worship. There's only one voice that is supreme, and that is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I have no control over your lives, and I don't want any control when you walk out that door. It is not my job to control your life. It's my job to preach, and then what you do with it is between you and God. But we've made idols out of pre We've made idols out of denominations. Oh, the list could go on and on. But in the midst of this heathen debauchery, he just appears. There's no introduction. There's no genealogy given. There's no backstory on who he was, how he was called. It just says, all of a sudden, Elijah the Tishbite. Now, you know you got to be a prophet of God if you're called Elijah the Tishbite. Elijah means God is Jehovah. That was a rebuff to the face of Ahab. You're not God. Those idols are not God. God is Jehovah. Tishbite just simply means dweller of Tishbeth. That's all we know about him, city of Tishbeth. Don't know where it was, don't know anything about it, but all I know is one of the greatest prophets of God came out. And you know, you know the story. He challenged the prophets of Baal, of Baal. And Baal is just a general term that... that, that really covered all of the false Canaanite gods. and it, uh, They came under a multitude of names, but the, the, the ball was just kind of given the, the, the general name to cover it all. I mean, it, went, it, it covered human sacrifice. It covered temple prostitution. It covered all the way to Israel and their horrible state, well, I'm going to say that because some, some of you need to be woken up, and, and, and you can't, well, you shouldn't say that. No, you, you need to wake up and hear the truth. They literally built, as the idols they worshiped, they literally built phalluses, carvings of the male reproductive organ, and that's what they worshiped, evil. Sin will take you lower and lower and deeper and deeper into debauchery. And he says, all right, let's have a contest. Hollywood couldn't have written a better script than this. Get your prophets, all of your prophets of Baal. Well, there was really 800 and something, but right there's only 450. Get them all. Build your altar and let the God that is God answer by fire. 
And so they begin to build their altar, and they begin to cry out to their God. Now, now the, 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 I don't have time to go to all of it, but the deception was when they would do stuff like this, what they would do is they would, they would hide one of the false prophets into the middle of the altar, and he would start the fire and then run out. And so they would think that their God had answered by fire. But not this time. And they kept hollering, Baal! Baal! Have you ever noticed these, the, 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 all these gods that people worship, the dumbest names that you've ever heard in your life? And they start screaming, Baal! Baal! And Elijah's sitting back watching them. One hour. Two hours, three, four. And then Elijah starts mocking them. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to yell a little bit louder. Maybe he's on a far journey. Come on, li yell louder. And he just kept egging them on. He kept pushing them. Come on, where is he? Come on, where is your God? We've been waiting all day. And finally, Elijah said, that's enough. That's enough. Now it's time. Now it's time for the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob to show up. Now is the time for the gospel. Now is the time for it to go out. Hallelujah. He said, give me 12 stones. Why 12? 12 is God's number of government. God's government is founded on the word of God and the cross. That's the foundation. Bring me 12 stones. And then he took the 12 stones, he made the altar. He said, now dig a trench all the way around the altar. A big old hole, a trench all the way around it. Why? The trench speaks of separation. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. There is separation. God help us. When the world is in the church and it's no different. When God help us when we copy the things of the world. God help us. But there is to be separation. Now, I didn't mean isolation. We don't isolate ourselves. We're in this world, but we're here to let our light shine. Let me just help you even more. If the people you spend most of your time with in fellowship is not saved, what do you have in common? Hello? I got lots of acquaintances that are not saved, but I'm not having fellowship with them. I'm trying to point the way, but we have nothing in common. We have nothing to fellowship over. Now, when I get them saved, we got something to fellowship over. Put that trench God has raised up this network to point out the world. The world is your enemy, folks. There's nothing out there that is any good for the child of God. The devil has nothing, absolutely nothing. Then it said he put the wood over the rocks. He put the wood into order. The wood speaks of Calvary, the cross. I get so irritated when people that are supposed to be Christian, why are you talking about a wooden beam? We're talking about what happened. Why did, what, what, Paul would over and over, he would say, for the preaching of the cross 
is foolishness. Why did he say something else? Because it's what happened there. It's what happened there. He set the wood in order. God has a divine order to everything that he does. Then he took a bullock and he cut it into pieces. And he took the bloody masses of that bullock and threw it on the top of that altar. That bullock was a type of Christ. He suffered. He died. He shed his blood for us. For us. He did it for us. Then the Bible said that he said, take four barrels and fill it with water. Four barrels. Pour it on top of the altar. Saturate the altar in water. Two meanings to that. Number one, it spoke of the Word of God. Paul said, Ephesians, we are washed by the water of the Word. That means everything we do must be saturated in the Word. It's not a little dab here, but we must be saturated in the Word of Almighty God. Then four is another meaning. North, south, east, and west. Jesus died for everyone. What we preach is not a white man's gospel. What we preach is not a Western gospel, but what we preach is the only message that will set the white man, the black man, the brown man, the red man, the yellow man free. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Singers, musicians are going to be making your way back. Then he said, Pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Everything Jesus did was according to the Word of God. Do it three times. Pour that water three times. Why three? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, the triune Godhead. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And then the Bible said he filled the trench with water. He didn't just saturate the water. Fill the trench. Not just a little bit, but fill the trench. He wanted to be no mistake about the power of Jehovah. Saturate the altar. Fill the trench with water. Oh, I love this. I love this. And the moment that he finished, and it was saturated, and that trench was filled with water, the Bible says that the fire of the Lord fell. Oh, hallelujah. It fell at that moment, and it fell on that sacrifice, and it burned it completely. It licked the water out of that trench up. It, it, it took it, and it burned that sacrifice. That speaks of the judgment of God. 2,000 years ago at Calvary, Jesus Christ took the punishment and the judgment that you deserve, that I deserve. He has judged it. Hallelujah. And now that all that will come, there is no condemnation. There is no incrimination. There is no interrogation. He says, come, 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 all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, now when... The altar was prepared. Now, there's a second part to this message, but I'm not going to start it until next week. Because when the altar is repaired, the rain will come. When the altar is repaired, Dad said it's Wednesday. I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I can hear the sound of an abundance of rain. So let me just help you. For almost 10 years, you know what we've been doing seven days a week? 
365 days a year, we've been repairing the altar. And you know what? The rain is coming. The rain is coming. The rain is coming. The rain is coming. I said the rain is coming. The rain is coming. The rain is coming. The rain is coming. I can smell it. I can feel it. The rain is coming. A move of God is coming. Stand to your feet this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Every head bowed every eye, and every eye closed. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you to do something with me this morning. Every one of you that's here, you're here because what we preach has touched you. It has ministered to you. Part of that call of world evangelism that God has given us is the distribution of these expositor study Bibles. It's probably one of, if not the greatest mission outreaches outside of the preaching of the gospel. 37,000 plus requests that we have Tuesday. I'm just going to ask you to do this as we close this service. I want you to step out. I want us to fill this front. And we're going to join our faith together as it regards the upcoming Tuesday Bible thought. Come on. Come on right now. Don't you think they need it? It's amazing. One of those countries is Nicaragua. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I believe Jesus is. Come on. We're going to pray. And his talking to the pastor in Brazil he that I was preaching I can't pronounce the name of the town I, I really can't I occupy or something like that and there's about five or six different assemblies of God in Brazil it's it's like the different Baptist churches there's different but this was the largest this one this church was affiliated with the largest one they have, in Brazil, membership of a little over 12 million. They have well over about 150,000 ordained pastors. That's not counting licensed or Christian workers or workers in the church. They've already distributed, he was telling me, thousands of Bibles in that area. Actually, they have 6,000 Bibles sitting in their church right now. they got six conferences coming up starting in January in different areas of that state called Paraná. And he looked at me and he told me, he said, Brother Donnie, he said, I have such a burden for the pastors and the workers. He said, but to do it, we would need to reach our state alone. We would probably need 100,000 Bibles. And, I, and he said, but I know that's not possible. I said, oh, yeah, it's possible. Sure, it's possible. Yes, yes. Oh, I said, oh, yeah. And I said, no, I can't promise them to you tomorrow. But we'll get them to you. 
We'll get them to you. And he goes, he's starting, he goes, but I, 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 please tell Brother Swagger how, how much he can trust us. He said, we, we guard these Bibles. It's life. We, we, don't, we don't just hand them out discriminately, but everything is organized. He kept saying, tell him, he can trust us. He can trust us. And I said, we got it. We're with you. Because I already knew what they had done. The point I'm trying to make in this, they're asking. They're begging. I was in a meeting with a brother in Ghana just this week, last week. Dad had already gone home, but he brought his update. All the pictures of the Bible distributions in Ghana. That's one of the countries that we went on in television a couple of months ago. And he says, I'm here for one reason. He, he has friends in Texas. They drove him over. He said, can we have more Bibles? Can we have more Bibles? I got to get these Bibles out. I told him, I said, well, you're going to have to wait in line, but we'll get them to you. We'll get them. What I want you to do, I just want you to lift your hands and let's just join our faith that Tuesday, that when we close out, our prayer is very simple, that every single country on that list will be taken care of. Yes. And we can move. Because you see, every time we don't finish out that country, that pushes another country further back before they can get Bibles. So let's join our faith together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bring Tuesday before you, the yes, Bible yes, thought. Yes. God, we need a miracle. We've got a request for almost 38,000 Bibles. Lord, in the natural, it's impossible. But you are the God of impossibilities. I'm asking you to move across this nation and around the world to touch hearts and lives as it regards what you want them to do, as it regards the bible thon. And then, Lord, next year, each month, help us to get bigger and to grow larger and larger with the distribution that we may spread the expositor study Bible across the length and breadth of every continent. And Lord, bless your people as they are faithful to support your work. Bless them in their coming. Bless them in their going. Bless them in the city. Bless them in the field. Bless yes, their children. Yes. Let everything yes. their hand touch. Bless it. Bless it. Let the blessing chase them down. Hallelujah. Because of their faithfulness for the work of God. And we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hallelujah. One last thing. One last thing. When somebody says to you, what are they doing over at SBN? Just say they're rebuilding the altar. They're rebuilding. We love you. God bless you. Turn around. Be back tonight at 6 o'clock. Yeah.